o'clock on CNN. Parker Spitzer, weeknights on CNN. I want to read you a description uh, that you wrote of sure. Sarah Palin. You called her a narcissistic, money-grubbing hack. Um, <laughs> don't you love being quoted? Anyway, yeah. so Sarah Palin obviously has a lot of followers. Mm -hmm. She has. She's got the the Republican establishment scared to death. So there must be something more to Sarah than just that, huh? Well, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things that happened in the wake of this financial crisis, there was this enormous amount of, of anger and frustration in the population, and people were looking for someone to offer them a simple solution, a simple answer for what happened. And I, and I think Sarah Palin and the Tea Party, they've perfectly captured that anchor. They've, they've found a way to crystallize all that frustration and aim it in a direction. I, you know, I would quarrel with the direction that they've aimed it in, but I, they've done a very good job at that. I want to quote something you say in the book, a brilliant phrase, and you say, a loose definition of the Tea Party might be 15 million pissed off white people sent chasing after Mexicans on Medicaid by the small <laughs> handful of banks and investment banks, co banking companies, and then you continue on. This merger of the anger being manipulated by the investment banks and Wall Street, and as you point out, Wall Street is getting exactly what it wants, and the public is getting virtually nothing to help it. How did that happen? Well, I think what they've done is they've, uh, there are, people in America have uh, a lot of frustrations about government. They have a lot of frustrations about regulation. You talk to these people. I talk to tea partiers who own hardware stores and restaurants, and they're upset about things like health inspectors and ADA inspectors and these little nuisances that they see as being government intrusion. But they, they, they conflate that with regulation of these giant banks like Goldman Sachs and, and J.P. Morgan Chase, and they think it's the same thing. And what they've, met, what they've, they've managed to do is convince all these Americans to campaign for uh, deregulation of these massive companies under the banner of let's get the government off our back. Well, the Tea Party is actually doing the, the work, the, the legman, leg work for the big banks. How did exactly. that happen? I mean, how did that how did they not know that that's what they're doing? Well, I think it's, it was an organic process. I mean, uh, and, uh, people who say that the Tea Party isn't a grassroots movement, I think, are incorrect. I think, in some respects, it is a grassroots movement. Uh, you know, there are a lot, they were organized around a lot of local issues, but there were also powerful interests, the, the Koch brothers and other financiers, who, once they saw this movement happening, happening were more than willing to, to push it along and, and give it the energy and, and the resources that they needed to, to spread around the country. You know, again, I want to quote you because I think your words are just so good and it comes to the title of the book. You say, and it comes back to what you just mentioned, there are really two Americas, one for the grifter class and one for everyone else. In everyone else land, the world of small businesses and wage earners, wage earning employees, the government is something to be avoided. In the grifter world, however, government is a slavish lapdog that the financial companies that will be the major players in this book use as a tool for making money. Right. Describe these grifters, the Goldman Sachs's, the J.P. Morgan Chase's, and how they manipulate government to, to really use it to squeeze money out of the middle class. Well, I mean, a classic example is right after, you know, September 2008, a lot of these companies were going belly up. and. You know, you know, Morgan Stanley and, and Goldman Sachs, they apply to the government uh, for an overnight change in status from investment banks to they become commercial banks overnight, which allows them to essentially collect money from the Fed at 0% interest. And a lot of these banks turned around and they took money at zero and they lent it right back hey, to the government at three. When's the last time anybody else in the world called up a government bureaucrat at five o'clock and said, I need an answer and got it? by 7 a.m. the next morning. Right, right. And I mean, not only that, they And a check for $20 billion. And a check for $20 billion. I mean, the, the, the law mandated a five-day waiting period, which is nothing right. already, right. and they got it overnight on a Sunday night, these banks. They called up on a Sunday night, and they got the change the next morning. But to come back to the point that, that you so eloquently described, the moment the banks got their money, they suddenly persuaded the Tea Party to start rallying for shutting down the government's ability to help anybody else. Not a single mortgage person, a uh, person whose house was underwater, had a bankruptcy judge sort of undo the mortgage because the Senate forbade that and the banks lobbied against it. What was going on here? Well, again, I just think that there was a, this enormous, uh, you know, sentiment against government intrusion. And after the Obama got elected and they had the stimulus and the Homeowner Affordability Act, ordinary people had not seen the bank bailouts. They didn't actually see that happen. They didn't see the trillions of dollars that went to Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase. But they did see these programs that went to uh, minority homeowners, poor minority homeowners, their next door neighbors. And when they, and they saw the government bailing out those people, that's when they got angry. And they, again, they confused the two issues. But you do make a, I mean, you're very generous in acknowledging that there are, there are legitimate 
grievances. People Absolutely. have legitimate grievances against local and state governments. And that, but your point is that they shouldn't conflate that with things. On it's a, it's in a completely two completely different worlds. The the world of you know the small business owner who has to deal with the small government intrusions, these small regulations, and this this other world that exists up in the stratosphere where Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase and and Citigroup, where they're on the phone with these guys who used to work in their companies, and they're and they're basically making the rules of the game as they go along. Right. That is something entirely different than what right, ordinary well you, people you go through. You make the case that Alan Greenspan and Goldman Sachs are criminals. I mean, you make a pretty strong case for that. Why are you the only person saying that? Well, I think I'm not the only person saying that. I think there are Other a lot than of people. Elliot. <laughs> Other than Elliot, maybe. <laughs> I mean, uh, Greenspan is a separate case entirely, but clearly the banks during the, the mortgage bubble they were engaged in a, a massive fraud scheme that was essentially designed to, to take subprime or, a, or very risky mortgages and pawn them off on other people as AAA rated investments. This was something they did with their eyes wide open and it was a catastrophe for it, for the entire world basically and there nobody has gone to jail for this and it, instead we're, we're blaming the people who actually borrowed these mortgages. They're the, they're the villains in the crisis. In the Look, and it even gets worse because the Fed that Alan Greenspan shared, that Tim Geithner ran the New York Fed, had direct responsibility for overseeing this entire complex of relationships. Direct statutory responsibility. And Geithner, when he was being confirmed by the United States Senate, said, I've never been a regulator. An outright silly false statement. Sure. And so they completely claimed lack of responsibility when they were at the vortex of every piece of this. It even got worse than that. Alan Greenspan was actually encouraging ordinary Americans to take out option ARM mortgages. Right. They were actually saying, he was actually saying that fixed 30-year mortgages were sometimes a bad idea and that people could get more value out of option ARMs, which ended up blowing up the universe. Uh, you know, it, when, a, when the world's, uh, when the America's biggest regulator makes suggestions like that, it, have, it has a lot of weight.